chair, pews. Chairs in front of you. Phew, that's right. Yeah, okay. So um, if you borrow a Bible, whether it's a kid's Bible like these guys have or it's the, the ones that we have on the stage, uh, it's page 1012, so 1012. We've been working our way through the book of James, and last week, Pastor John did a great job um, at finishing off chapter 2 for us. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is no faith at all, James says. I really wanted to teach that message. I just wanted to stand up here, jump up and down and yell, and, and yep, and so another church asked me to speak over there, so we gave that one to John, but uh, maybe that was God saving you or me from whatever, but uh, yeah, so really, really wanted to do that message, but today we get another call to action that results from us living out a true faith, and so I'll give you a, a main idea that, we can write da- that you can write down if you're a note taker. A Christian speech is of great concern. Scripture gives a lot of attention to our speech, and Jesus makes clear that speech reveals what is truly in our heart. As Pastor Maudie said, at the end of the message, every week, we're going to do a short takeaway. I'm going to ask you, what is something you heard today that you want to apply to your life this week? I'm going to have you share that within your family or friends or whoever you're sitting around. And so be thinking through this. Take good notes. Consider the message today and how that applies to you. We'd love to hear that message kind of trickle out throughout the congregation. James chapter 3, let's pick up in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. So I want to begin with the question, why are Christian teachers, we're talking about, again, James is, if you remember this, James is writing to dispersed Christians, right? Mostly kind of this Hellenistic Jewish Christians that have been removed from Jerusalem, they were chased out of Jerusalem with persecution. And so they've scattered abroad. We follow some of the stories, like we see Philip go to uh, Samaria and some other places, and, and we see them settle in new places. And so James is not writing to one particular local church like Paul does in many cases. He's writing to Christians that are scattered in different areas, but he always assumes that they will go and become a part of a church right, that they will land somewhere and connect with other Christians. Kind of like Pastor Mati was saying, we need one another. We believe in membership in the local church, this covenant relationship between people that we are committed to being a family of faith. And so James believes they're going to land in a setting like that. They're going to go somewhere and belong to a church. And so he's writing to them in that context. And as he writes to them, he says, listen, many of us should not presume to be teachers, right? Teachers are going to be held to a higher accountability. So he's writing in the context of teachers, meaning teachers within the local church. Now we're going to apply that a little more broadly today, but he begins there. Why would he start with teachers? And and the answer is pretty obvious, that teachers have an impact on other people. That with our words, when we speak, when I teach, that if I am misleading you, that could even have eternal implications. Probably, if we take the eternity out of it, knowing God is sovereign over that, even if we just kind of remove that, but how you live the gospel out in your life, right? How we as leaders, elders in the church teach dictates how we do ministry, right? And so to do something that is not biblical, to do something that is wrong, to mislead people, you're not just misleading yourself, you're not just wrong about something, but you're misleading people. And so there's this caution up front But teachers are not the main idea today. Speech is the main idea today. But he starts out with a strong example, limiting it to teachers just in the first verse. In the next verse, he'll open it back up. But he's warning us, and he's giving us kind of the the mindset behind this warning is to remind us how important speech is, because teachers use speech. And speech can have such an impact that it misleads people And the teachers are held more accountable. The implication there is the Christian is held accountable for your speech. But I want to give you some optional ways to view teacher today. So take it out of elder or pastor for a minute and just think of different roles that many of you have. Disciplers, 
you who disciple others, right? That could be parents discipling their kids. That could be husbands discipling their wives. It could be older women discipling younger women, older men discipling younger men. It could be anything. But think about when you're discipling, you're teaching people about the faith. You're using scripture and your words to teach people. So remember, when you're in that setting, you're accountable for that. And that shouldn't push you out of it because we should all be disciplers. In the same way, kind of an early piece of discipleship is evangelism, right? Sharing the, the gospel with other people. We should all be sharing the gospel. We should also, also understand that when we share the gospel, we don't want to mislead people, right? We don't, and, and we've talked about this quite a bit over the last year, that we don't want to give false assurance to people. We don't want to call people and say, oh, they're a Christian because they said a prayer or this or that. We want to call them to a biblical understanding of what conversion is right? That you've gone from this to this, right? That when scripture calls us to follow Jesus, calls us to repent and be baptized, to turn from how we live and then to identify ourselves with Christ. Saying a prayer with somebody is great, but that's not what the Bible calls us to. So pray with them. Pray with them about Jesus, but then have them connect to a church, right? Make sure that repentance is a part of conversion, Understand that there is no following Jesus without an, a, an ultimately a change in all of your life. And so there's other ways. I think of husbands, as I just said earlier, parents, as I said. Bosses, if, if you run a business, the people that you employ or that work for you, you're accountable for that because you're a representation of Christ. Teachers of education, you who are teachers, right? Those who teach in different settings. That comes with a level of authority. And when people know that you're a follower of Christ and you're a teacher... They want to know about that, or they, that, they, that gives you that responsibility. So think of yourself and how you teach and how that might apply to you. Verse 2. Now he opens it back up. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect person, a man or woman able to bridle his whole body. So notice he says, we stumble in many ways. So James includes himself in this. Listen, we all fail. We all sin. We all make mistakes. There's a warning to teachers. There's a warning to people in a position of authority that there's more accountability to that. That's something that when you step into the role of being a pastor, you understand a stricter judgment, more accountability, that there's more on the line. And you, and you have to accept that or not do it. One of the two. Right? In order to lead, there comes a higher accountability. But then you also have to understand, we all stumble. We all make mistakes. Now, James is going to narrow this down, not just to we all sin, because that's easy, but that's generic, to we stumble in how we speak. And then he puts forward this idea, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body, literally equating being perfect with the ability to just control our speech. Now, controlling our speech wouldn't make us perfect. We're still sinful, right? What he's doing is he's, he's giving us the being perfect and controlling your speech like they're equal, and he does this to show you the impossibility, if you will, of fully controlling our speech, right? That we all make mistakes in this area. So yes, we're all sinful. Yes, we all make mistakes. But what he's asserting now is that we all fail in the area of speech. In Proverbs, it says this, and I was just telling the Sunday school class earlier, uh, the next book we're going to teach through is the book of Proverbs. And so you'll hear a lot of Proverbs verses in James, because I'm thinking about both of them at the same time. Proverbs 21, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Proverbs is practical theology for the everyday Christian, right? God's wisdom on how to live. Both Proverbs and Jesus, and James, all agree that taming the tongue, that's a hard thing, right? That our speech is an incredibly important part of our faith. Verse 3, if we put bits into the mouths, mouths of horses so that they obey us, and we guide their whole bodies as well, right? We guide their whole bodies as well. So James is going to give us three illustrations. The first one is this idea of a bit and a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. So 
you know, how big is a horse and strong is a horse? I know there's different sizes, but horses are big, right? These are horses we're intending to carry us and move us from one place to another, especially in an era, obviously, before cars or things like that, that this was a, a mode of transportation. And it takes this little bit that fits in the mouth, held there by a bridle in order to steer and control a horse. So think of how more, much more powerful the horse is than you or me, and that it takes this little thing to control that really strong horse. That's his idea. No matter how strong, how big the horse is, he will not overcome this small bit in bridles. You get the image, right? Big, strong horse, little guys, you guys got this, right? Big, strong horse, bit in his mouth, and you can control the entire horse. Verse 4, he says, look at the ships also. They are so large and driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. I was looking up royal clipper ships, because clipper ships are kind of what I'm thinking of in the Bible. They have these massive sails and all these things that like, when I think of Paul getting around, I see him on a big ship like this, and royal clipper ships, I just looked this up, a gigantic clipper ship has 42 different sails on it. I didn't know that, so I don't know a whole lot about ships and sailboats and boats, but big thing with multiple masts and 42 different sails, and the idea is that all this that sticks up out of the water, these masts, these sails, these gigantic things are then what the, the, the wind catches, and the wind catches this, and it moves the boat through the water, right? And just think about how big all this is and how strong the wind has to be to move a boat from here to here, like through the ocean, through the waves, through all these different things, and yet hidden below the water, there's this little thing called a rudder, right? Just just a fraction of the size of the ship, and yet it controls the direction of the ship. No matter how strong the wind and the other things are, they, they rely on this one small part to kind of direct and guide the boat. Verse 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. We've all heard the horror stories of forest fires being set by, you know, a a spark from a car, a cigarette or something thrown out, or a spark that flies out of a fireplace and, and or a fire and, and catches other things, that this little spark can ignite a forest fire that does incredible damage. Right? We live in Southern California. We're entering into that hot season. We're going to hear about fires. I mean, God willing, we wouldn't. That would be great. But fires, we see, I, we go off-roading and stuff, and we'll see places after areas have been burnt down, and we see the impact of that, and sometimes when they're close, we'll see the smoke kind of all over the place, and then we'll find out that this one little thing started it, right? That some little spark somewhere, maybe somebody was careless, and it ignited all this flame. So are we getting the point of the bit and the bridle, the ship and the rudder, the, the spark that causes the forest fire? He's, James is, is outlining for us these little things that have great impact, right? Little things that give us great control, or little things that if they get out of control, they have a huge and, and terrifying, often, impact, like a forest fire. Let's read verse 5 again. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. When James says tongue today, he's specifically speaking to our speech, right? That the tongue, when, when Jesus says that too, right, that the idea is that he's talking about our speech. It's not the literal tongue, but the tongue, what the tongue does, what the mouth does in this case, right? And it's a common biblical theme to show us how important the topic of speech is for the follower of Jesus. Here's some quick verses to consider. Matthew 12. So both of these are going to be Jesus speaking. Matthew 12, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So remember that. So now many of you heard this a lot of times, maybe you've memorized this verse, but out of the overflow or out of the abundance, depending on which translation you memorized, 
out of the overflow of the heart, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? The mouth is not this thing that just runs its own show, right? It comes from somewhere. And Jesus is talking about what's within you, what's in you. And, and again, in this case, heart is metaphoric. What is in the core of you, who you are, that's what comes out of your mouth. When you speak, it comes from who you are, from who you are deep inside of you. In Mark 7, same idea. He says, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So speech is talked a lot about cover to cover, Old Testament, New Testament, all throughout the wisdom literature, the teachings of the prophets, the teachings of Jesus, and the writings of the apostles. But it's not just for the words, right? Because the words come from somewhere. They come from inside of us. They, they come out, and sometimes without control, they come out, and they reveal what's inside of us, the sin that's inside of our heart. Or it could be, and the good, the good that comes out of us too. But Jesus makes it really clear out of the overflow or the abundance of what's in your heart, that's what comes out your mouth. James says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Let's talk about the obvious elephant in the room from last weekend, right? Pardon the pun on elephant. But we had a shooting of a presidential candidate. A former president got shot, right? As he is campaigning to become president. And a lot of the dialogue around this, I think, has been good about kind of pulling back the speech in America, right? Reeling back the rhetoric around politics. Now, before I, I lean into this a little bit, what I want you to hear is to blame either Biden's speech or Trump's speech or blame someone's speech with someone else's shooting is like blaming someone who got raped on what they were wearing. You can't do that, right? You can't blame one thing for another thing, right? The guy who took a shot is a guy who took a shot. He took a shot, he was wrong, he was evil, he's dead now, but he, was, he chose that, right? But how do we have a culture where this seems like a good idea and that part relates to our speech? Trump's speech? his entire campaigns before, Biden's speech today, all our political dialogue, the newscasters on all the different channels, granted Fox News is saying it about this side and MSNBC and CNN, whatever they're saying it about this side, but the speech, the rhetoric is bad. It's one of the ways that it shows just kind of the decline of our political system, right? It has become super common over the last two or three election cycles to just name call and identify people with evil. Oh, Trump is Hitler. Oh, sleepy Joe Biden or lion Joe Biden. It depends on which campaign it was, right? And what's worse is Americans have picked that up. And then we hear it in the news. And then we hear it on social media or see it on social media. And we're, we're saying it. It's just the speech has devolved in things that little kids do. Right? We teach little guys, we're like, hey, don't you call your brother names, right? They say, you don't do that ever, right? You guys are perfect. <laughs> we're like, hey, don't say that. Don't call them names. You don't do that. That's what little kids do, right? And we want to teach them not to do that. Now, people running for the highest office in our land are constantly calling each other names. Speech. And out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, our hearts are corrupt. Our politicians are corrupt. Our system is broken. It may still be one of the best in the world, but it's devolving into name-calling. And no longer can you just disagree and say, you know what, I disagree with you, you disagree with me, but you're a good dude, you're a good woman, we just disagree. Now you don't agree, you're evil. Right now, if we don't agree, you are clearly not on the side of Jesus, and, and I am, right? Oh, the Bible says that, oh, the Bible says, I've never heard so many verses come out of campaigns, out of both sides until political seasons, and, and just, you're like, man, none of this is on the side of Jesus anymore. That's where we've gotten to. But it starts with speech, right? It starts with the foul things we will say on our 
polit political flags and bumper stickers and social media posts and t-shirts and this and that and the other thing. But what we need to be concerned with as followers of Jesus is that represents what's in our heart and we represent Jesus. That should give it a weight to it. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Here's a note for you. Speech reveals the heart. Our speech flows from what's in our hearts. And if our, in our heart is sinful, our speech, excuse me, if our heart is sinful, our speech will follow. However, if our hearts are given to Jesus, our mouths will reveal that too. There's no exception for you can talk however you want to about someone you disagree with. In fact, I would say the test is how you speak to or about someone you disagree with. It's easy to say nice things about people you agree with. That's easy, right? As Proverbs would say, even the wicked do that. It's how we speak about those we disagree with and those we disagree with on the deepest level. Never forget, to, and I've shared this story before, but uh, before swearing into the military, we had this, we had this uh, officer just give us this speech. I don't remember a whole lot of it, uh, but at the MEF station in L.A., I remember, I remember him saying that you are going to defend other people shouting with the loudest voices the things you disagree with most, and you are willing to give your life for them. Some of you know that, Right? Because this nation offers us that freedom of speech, but the problem is when we abuse that freedom and when our speech becomes inappropriate and sinful and condescending and we can no longer just disagree, but now we're not both, we're not both okay with it. One is good, one is bad. And there are some bad things out there. That's okay. But now everything is evil. Everything is extreme. Verse 6, back in James, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting the fire on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. James doesn't mix a lot of words here, right? Setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. That's a pretty good indictment of our modern political process and social media, right? But I want you to consider Genesis chapter 3. Just you think back, you know, God, in, in chapter 1, you know, God is creating. Chapter 2, it zooms in, gets a little more detailed account of how humanity is created. Genesis 3 records for us how sin entered into human history. And I'm just going to read a little part of it to you. Satan comes to the humans, comes to Adam and Eve, right? And he tempts them. And I want you to hear how this goes. He says, he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So he's questioning what God says, right? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. She's a little off track by that moment. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. No, in other words, God's lying. You won't die. He says this, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Sin came into human history through temptation, through temptation by words. Through temptation of evil, questioning God, challenging God, contradicting God, and saying what God has given you is not enough. You need this. Right? Speech has an impact. Our words actually make a difference. Let's reread that. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. He says the tongue is a member, it's set among our members, part of our body, right? And it stains our whole body. And there's a bit of a play on speech here, right? So our speech, our tongues affect everything. They, they stain the rest of our body, right? Our whole lives are affected and stained by our speech because it reveals the sin in our hearts. But the play on words here is the members and body thing. And it was a good verse that Pastor Maudi read earlier, talking about belonging to one another in a church, that we are members of one another, right? So all who are members of generations of, 
have said together that we belong, that we're accountable to one another. We belong to one another, right? In a unique way, and we're trying to learn how to best live that out. And he's saying the same thing, but the tongue is a member, and it stains the whole body. The wordplay here is he's reminding us that we who represent Christ, when we get out there and speak in ways that are inappropriate for Christians to speak, whatever that might be, we put a stain on the body of Christ, right? We misrepresent the body of Christ. So if you're out there and you're posting on social media or bumper stickers or political flags or t-shirts or whatever it is your thing that represents yourself, not just your speech, but everything you're saying with all the different ways you can do that, and you're doing that, understand you are not only, not only affecting your own life, but you're also kind of staining the body of Christ, that there's a, a dual nature, a dual outcome to that. That our speech is representative of us as well as our own individual selves. See, we often like to think of that our sin only, it's just going to impact me. It's just my, it doesn't have an impact on everybody else, but it does. This speech thing has, has affected our entire culture. So how is our speech shown? How how do we reveal our hearts? How does speech stain our body? So politics, we've talked about that. Inappropriateness in politics and political speech right now is huge. A few other things. Gossip. Nothing tears a church down faster than gossip. I've been doing this for 20 years and and was in churches prior to that, for years prior to that. But in leadership, you really get to see that. You just see when these conversations happen over here and these conversations happen over here and these people begin to talk about one another but they won't talk to each other, nothing tears a church apart faster. Social media is the thing of the day, right? About any topic at any given time, your comments for and against things or your venting so everyone can see, remember that's your speech. That comes out of your heart, gets posted on social media. Right? And it's not only a representation of yourself, good or bad, but it's a representation of the church and Christ in general. Right? The things that we post about, whether we think we're experts on every topic out there, or we think that we can vent because that's what everybody else does, it kind of devolves into the lowest common denominator. I would include in this, and I know a lot of our young ladies just went to camp, but the pictures you post. And dudes, the pictures you like or they wouldn't post them. What you're saying with that little thumbs up, right? What do we want our young women to value about themselves? We'll see what they value by what they post. And we'll see what our men value by what they like, what they look at. Men, we're perpetuating the problem. Social media is truly what verse 6 says, a world of unrighteousness. Verse 7, for every kind of beast and bird, and reptile, and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Right? We all know that, like, almost everything that can be tamed out there has been somewhat tamed, right? People do shows with lions and tigers and bears. I know. Oh, my. But I know. I heard it coming out, too. Couldn't stop myself. (laughs) Had to say it. You know, we know there's some things that go wrong, and sometimes those who have tamed those animals will get bit. But for the most part, you've seen seen animals who are much greater than the human being tamed by the human being. And this is a classic. Again, remember, this probably isn't important for our message today, but for the book of James it is. Remember, James is very Jewish, right? He was a Jew who started following Jesus after this resurrection and started leading the church in Jerusalem, filled with Jewish Christians. And so he writes in a very Jewish way, right? Notice the categories of beast and bird, or reptile, sea creature. That's all like creation language, right? He's kind of referring himself back to like, we've tamed all of that. We've tamed the world, yet we can't seem to get a handle on our tongue. Like we seem to struggle with that. And then he says, no human being can tame the tongue. Now, he's not writing something for us to read, for us to understand, and then saying, hey, do this. Oh, by the way, you can't do it. It's not what he's saying. No human being can tame the tongue. 
But that's his gospel entry point, right? The understanding that the gospel is that we were created by God, that we were made by God to give glory to God, to be worshipers of God, right? That our speech would bring glory to God. Right, Jacob led us through prayer this morning of adoration. Let our speech proclaim what we adore, what we love about God, right? And we try and when we sit down and we talk about maybe like Selah, like Alex talked about, is that adoration is different than thanksgiving, right? Adoration, we're giving attribute or or worth or glory or praise to God for who he is. Thanksgiving is for what he's done, right? People slip in, in and out of both of those. That's okay. But that our speech was designed to do that, that when we talk to one another, apart from sin, that everything we say would be glorifying to God, right? That our speech would not do anything but give honor and glory to the God who we profess to serve. But sin entered into human history, and we just read about that. Sin, humanity is tempted, and they they fall into that temptation. They eat, they disobey God. They really, what happens, it, it isn't what they do that so much matters, is that God said this, and they do the opposite. Basically, believing they know better than God. They bought the lie that God had withheld something good from them. And so they fall into sin, and from that moment, humanity has been corrupted by sin, right? Like infidelity in a marriage, it's separate now, right? That sin separated them from God. They chose to worship their own way, and then God gives them to that. Well, you want to follow that, and you follow that. You want to be in charge, you be in charge, right? But because of sin and separation and corruption, humanity is separated from God, And so every human being, all the way up to us now, born separated from God, right? Utterly sinful and incapable of changing that fact. But God so loved the world that he provided an answer. Because here's what happened. Because God is holy, because now humanity is sinful and corrupt, and because they're separate, and because humanity is sinful and corrupt and can't work their way back, now God must come to humanity. Not must, God chose to. God could have let us be who we chose to be. But instead, out of love, out of grace, out of mercy, God becomes flesh in Jesus. And Jesus lives a life you and I are called to live. And then he dies death in our place for us, paying the penalty for our sin. And because he does that, and he he is laid in a grave to give us forgiveness, and then resurrected from the grave to give us new life, now in Christ we can be made new. As Jesus ascends back to heaven, that's why he says, it's better that I go away, that I can give you my spirit, place my spirit within you. So not only has the resurrection started new life, but now under the lordship of Christ, for those who have repented and believed in Jesus, been baptized or following Jesus, they're now also indwelled by his spirit empowered to live new lives. It's never the gospel saying, I'll give you forgiveness, now you go figure out your life. You go try really hard. In fact, the Bible's telling you, you can't. No one can, we can tame all the animals on the planet, but we can't tame the tongue. But see, God can. God who created the tongue, God who created the heart, God who saved us from sin can transform our lives. See, James has been talking to us about a true faith. He says some say they have faith, but it doesn't look so much like it. But he talks about saving faith. That saving faith comes with works. It isn't earned by works, but it comes with things you do. You live a changed life. You begin to live differently. In this case, you begin to speak differently because of the change made within you. See, in Ezekiel 36, this this promise made by God long before Jesus came, it's this. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So what does it take to tame our speech? Well, 
first and foremost, and the easiest way to say it is it takes the gospel. It takes us placing ourselves in Christ, right? Us responding to the call of the gospel, trusting completely in faith in Christ. And then when we do that, not only are we forgiven, cleansed, right? But we're also empowered to be different. So let's just go through this. What, is it, what does it take to tame our speech? Well, cleansing and changing, which is a, a work that God alone can do. A removal of our idols and a replacing them with a love for Jesus. Because out of the overflow of the heart, where we give ourselves to idolatry, the mouth speaks. A new heart given by God that is for him and not against him. It's the one of the, I will remove from you a heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. It's one of the few places in the Bible where flesh is not, where flesh is a good thing. Typically, sin is associated with our flesh, but he's like, I'll, I'll take the hard heart away, and I will give you a heart that can beat for God, is what God's saying, right? And a new spirit I will put within you, right? Awaken up your dead spirit, and I'll place my spirit in you to cause you to be different. And then he closes with his power, right, to cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God says, I will cause the change, Right? Our job is submit to the change. God's job, cause the change, empower the change, be the change, right? Our job is to surrender to it and not to follow our own desires. So if it's speech and we want to say this, that shows what's in our heart. So we don't work on just fixing our speech, we go back to our heart. We go back, repent of the things inside of us that are causing the speech to come out. Verse nine, with our tongue, he says, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Right, to bless would be praise and worship bring glory, to evangelize, to disciple, to pray. With our mouth, we do these things. We came in this morning, I was just listening, is it Psalm eight, that was the song? Yeah, Psalm eight, love that song. It's kind of a mixture of Psalm eight and the Lord's prayer. We sing that, just listen to you guys sing sometimes because I'm all the way over on the side. I get to hear you and I face you. With our mouths, we bless God. When we pray, most people are praying silently, but you hear those, you kind of hear these little things and just enjoy hearing us pray together as a church. But he says, you do that and then you curse people. You gossip, you slander, you tear down, right? You call names, you do this, you do that. Right? You undermine their humanity, their intentions, their ideas. Speaking against people is speaking against the people whom God created. He says, you curse people who are made in God's image. Oh, well, that doesn't count if they're a Democrat or a Republican, right? No, no, it counts, right? What if they're independent? Yes, if they're independent, right, yes, right? We are not at liberty to speak coarsely against those we disagree with. There's no curse, only wrong people clause. I'll just let it sit there. No, I won't. And that's good, right? That's good for you. It's good for me, right? Let's read it again, verse 9. With our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. The idea of cursing other people, God made them too. Right, wrong, or indifferent, and you could be wrong. You could be right. But they're made by God. They're given equal dignity to you. All of them. Even the bad ones. Even the ones that vote the other way. Wear the other team jersey, right? Yeah, all of them. Anyhow, so... Uh, Verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not be so. James is like, it should not be like that. Your speech should not do what it does. Now he's talking about we who bless God and then curse others. So the assumption is the people who bless God at least profess some form of faith in God, right? Now James gives a lot of ifs. Just because you say it, he does not assume you actually are it, right? Just because you profess to be a Christian, we don't assume you actually are. 
The point last week was, you say you have faith. I'll show you what I believe by how I live, right? So if you're saying this about God, but then you speak to people this way, he's like, let's go back to the first question, because I'm not sure you're in Christ. Now again, there's always this big caveat. If you've been walking with Jesus for like five minutes, you're not held to the same standards as those who've been walking for five months, five years, 50 years, etc. Because change takes time. Right? And there are things we're all doing wrong that we don't even know we're doing wrong. It takes time. You've got to learn, be convicted about something, repent of something, grow in that area, mature in that area. That's why it takes a church. And that's why it takes a unique relationship among church members. Because you have to be connected in that way. The gospel issue here is hypocrisy. You cannot be two different people. You cannot profess a faith in Jesus and speak sinfully towards others that Jesus made. That'd be like a vegan who is telling you all the time how their diet is better for their lives and how this is so cruel to animals and how all these things are wrong and how we really got to change this, but really loves bacon. I'm not pointing out which side of that dialogue is sin. I'm just throwing that out there, right? Vegan, 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 you see them at in and out On Sunday, you're like, that just doesn't match up, right? <laughs> Last week's message called out people who profess to have faith but live inconsistent with that in their works. Now, James is calling out one of those works as speech that reveals the truth about what's in our hearts. That's the distinction between saving faith and what last week John called, uh, James called, not saving, non-saving faith, right? That there's a difference. You can believe in Jesus. You can believe that Jesus was human. You can believe he was God. You can believe he lived and died and, and rose. You can believe things, but not have faith in them. There's a difference. I believed in Jesus for many years without having faith in Jesus and was at my lowest and worst points. I believed in Jesus. I had no faith in Jesus. I didn't trust Jesus to live for. I didn't worship Jesus. I believed that he lived like I believed that my great-great-grandparents, who I never met, lived. You can believe something. Remember last week's, even the de demons believe and shudder? Like, even the demons believe in Jesus. Like, they actually know Jesus. That does not mean they're believers. To have saving faith means you have placed your trust, your faith, your belief in, and your actions are now following it. It's the vegan giving up bacon, right, for what it's worth. Verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives and a grapevine produce figs? Neither can salt pond yield fresh water. So James, again, closes with some illustrations. He gives you something that produces something, and it doesn't produce two different things. An apple tree is going to give you apples, because that's what it does. It doesn't produce some apples and some oranges, right? That would be an amazing tree, though. But he gives us these illustrations of fresh water and salt water and a grapevine and not producing figs, it, it, he does so to remind us that our heart needs to be one thing as well. That our heart needs to produce what it's intended to produce. True faith is consistent with actions and speech that reveal a changed heart. True faith constantly points to a transformed person who is living for Jesus in the power of the gospel. True faith which is what is missing in so many Americans who profess faith today. They're not living for Jesus, right? Most of our political dialogue, they all say they're following Jesus. They all think they're on team Jesus somehow, some way. But then we see little of that in the way that people act. In Luke 6, it says this again, this is Jesus speaking, for no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. 
For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good, and the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? What's in there is what will come out. You can get a good governor on the front of it that will stop you from saying some things you have some level of self-control. But what's in there will come out. Speech isn't actually the problem. It's what lives in our heart. It's the sin in our hearts that comes out. This passage is a unique one. There's no resolve. There's no solution. There's no, hey, do this. There's just a don't do that. Right? What to do is implied. What to do is to not do this. To have your speech match up with your heart. That your heart must change. That will change your speech. And the same thing is true that you can take any work, anything that you do, it falls out of your heart. And if you change your heart, you change the outcomes. Right? We spend a lot of time trying to mod modify our behaviors. Well, I want to say this less, or say this more, or do this less, or do this more. We try and modify our behavior, but what we miss most of the time is that what we need is a heart change. See, the gospel changes our hearts. It changes who we worship and how we worship. And then everything that flows out of that is change in behavior. But we don't have behavior problems. We have belief problems. Because what we believe in our heart causes how we behave. Today, what application will you make? What is something you heard today that you want to apply to your life? Hey, there's so many examples today, so many different ideas. I'm not going to go through a list of, hey, here's my takeaway. Well, you know, if you're, if you've been, you're not a believer, you are a believer, whatever, just know this, believer or non-believer, follower of Jesus, committed or not, that it isn't about what we do, it's about what's inside that the gospel inside transforms who we are, and that's what comes out. And that's why James can say with all confidence, you say you have faith, I will show you my faith by my actions. I will show you my faith by how I speak to people. I will show you my faith by how I don't speak to people I disagree with. Because my faith changes what comes out. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So take a few minutes, turn with your families, with your friends, whatever it might be. If you're here, if, you've, if, if somebody is alone by you, please include them. But what is one thing you heard today that you want to apply to your life this week?